<laughs> That's just how we put it. We're clear down in the North Court, we're down by the Fremont Bridge, and over the big arch bridge, the flag's on top. I used to tell my patients that they need to fill their prescriptions to go across the street to Dawson Park. <laughs> you can buy anything over at Dawson Park. You know. Quality control is not so great, but you can buy it there. Um, <clears throat> and we say that because we still have people, even after us being there for 46 years, we have people say, we're exactly in OHSU where you located. Because everybody thinks everything is up the hill. The problem with that is if you think we're at the hill and you're doing a transport to Portland, you'll end up on the wrong side of the river and the opposite side of town, which is a delay in transport. So we really stress that, especially for our first responders that were located in the manual. Now, OHSU has great trauma services, but they don't have a burn center. So you all believe in patient advocacy, right? What to do is right for the patient. Well, if you have a trauma and a burn, you want to go where they do both things or where they only do one. I want to go where they do both. And we do both because we have a level one trauma center on campus at Emanuel and Randall's Kids Hospital right next to the burn unit. So we can take care of all those things right there. Your stay is shorter, your cost is less, your outcomes are better, you go where the experts are. If I needed a liver transplant, I'd go to the hill. I wouldn't go to Emanuel because we don't do that there. So you know where the experts are at. Um, there's 123 burn centers in the United States. We're a verified burn center. About half the burn centers across the US are verified. The closest ones to us are Seattle, Salt Lake, and Sacramento. Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and Alaska do not have burn centers, so we take those patients at the burn centers that I just named. All of us have level one trauma centers on the same campus. All of us have pediatrics. Shriners is right across the street from UC Davis, and they have the same medical directors at both units. So in our little corner of the world, we, we're pretty lucky that we have that step where if you're going to wrap anywhere and get burned anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, you've got four choices, fairly close to one another. That you can go to. Uh, we're a 16 bed unit. In about three years, we're going to have a new unit. We'll have 20 beds, we'll be on the opposite side of campus from where we are now. Which would be better because then we'll actually be next to the hospital. Right now we're clearing out the far end of campus. We're kind of almost in another county, it seems like. <clears throat> in a disaster, we take this number and split it in half and add it to the total. We can take 24 patients in a disaster or a new year, we'll take 30. And we offer all this stuff here because where we're located, it takes a long time to get things to us. So we're, all, we're basically our own self-contained little hospital in the burn center. Everything you find in the main hospital, you'll probably find in the burn center that we can just do what we need to do right there without having to wait for people, people or supplies to come over to us. Tom mentioned that we donate our time. And all of the talks that I do, no matter where I'm at, no matter where I go, it's paid for through a grant. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be in Vegas at our national convention, and that's all paid for. When I go to Montana or Alaska or California to run for classes, it's all paid for. But it's paid for through donations to the burden. I actually do Santa Claus at Christmas time. No way. And I started doing it last year because I found out, I thought mall Santas must get paid pretty good. No, they don't. <laughs> mall Santas also smell of beer and body. <laughs> Sorry if there's any mall Santas in there. But the guys who do professional Santa Claus stuff, where it's like a family has a party and they want Santa Claus to come for them, they'll be there for the kids, or uh, realtors have things for their, their clients and they want to have Santa Claus come in and they take pictures of Santa Claus, whatever. We started at $150 an hour. I'll grow up here for $150 an hour. And it goes up to about $300 an hour depending on what function you're doing. Now, if you really want to make a lot of money with Santa Claus, think about this one. You show up at the boom box, you know, hey, hey, Santa's here. <laughs> oh my God. Those guys make a lot of money. Um, but my wife said if I do that, I'd have to pay them to show up. So, you know, that is. But I donate all of my money to the burn unit because I know that every penny goes to the burn unit. It doesn't go to the administrative costs. Uh, because the uh, foundation is paid for through the hospital, so all the money you donate to hospitals goes to what you donate. But these are the people who have given us the most money over the years. So we always acknowledge them. You'll notice a theme up here, okay? The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Pacific Power, Portland General Electric, Northwest Natural Gas, 
you kind of see the theme roll along here. And of course, Legacy Emanuel for the enrollment for the grants. Somebody said, why do you keep doing talks for the electric industry? We never see anybody in the firm unit, partly at all, from electrical industry. Well, you just answered your own question. It's because of prevention. Prevention isn't something that happens after you're hurt. Prevention is something that happens before you get hurt to stop you from getting hurt. And a lot of people don't understand that's how the prevention world works. So we've done a pretty good job, and a lot of those guys aren't getting hurt on the job anymore. And they do some amazing work. You all know that from, with the big storms we just had recently and keeping the power on and stuff for you. They're out there working in some pretty horrific conditions. Here's the Burn Center entrance. Um, we'll be on the third floor in our new unit, so we won't have an entrance right there into the burn unit. But this used to be where we admitted patients, and this room is now an overflow room for ICU, because we're pretty much always full of need to have a couple of extra beds just in case. But in this room is all of our supplies, and we have supplies right across the hall in the supply room that's restocked every day just in case. And we have Pixis in here. We have all of our carts for wound care and everything. Uh, respiratory therapy has a station back here. We have a 12 lead EKG, and all of our monitors have a special adapter on it to use things called needle electrodes. S scar is burned tissue, and S scar sticky stuff will stick to it. So, a little needle that goes right through the S scar that do the same thing as a sticky pad. Um, and you can do 12 leads with them. You just have to be careful with infants that you don't punch your lung because they're a little, they're kind of long. Uh, we have a portable x ray machine. All we need is a radiology kit. They can go over and shoot the films, and we've got the feedback right there on the spot because the films show up on top of the machine. We have two machines called Bobies. They're electronic scalpels. If you have a circumferential burn, it acts like a tourniquet. So we get you in the anatomical position. We do what's called an escarotomy. We cut down to the escar to open that up so that you get circulation back. Um, who do you work for besides teaching for paramedic? Uh, I'm a volunteer for Pleasant Hill Ocean Fire Department. Okay. Uh, I teach here. I'm also doing the paramedic program. So okay. I'm not do you know they have Dopplers on the rigs? No, no, we don't. You don't. Okay, some people are starting to do that. Yep. As long as you can get a Doppler signal, you're okay. So that's why I kind of encourage, because I don't think they're that expensive, so I kind of encourage EMS to start putting Dopplers on their rigs, because they're just a nice... The, the talk is current right now. One of the agencies in Lane County, Western Lane, they're kind of leading a lot of the stuff. They're a little bit smaller, so they can do it quicker. Ah. They're thinking about doing ah. Dopplers, but you've got to... Training cost worthwhile. Yeah. I'll talk to Matt. I'll poke Matt a little bit and say, hey Matt, you guys have fun with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing some classes for him, so he owes me one. Okay. <laughs> um, but some people do carry them. So as long as you can hear a Doppler signal, you're okay. But on transport, just get their extremities elevated, cut down on the edema, mm -hmm. and that'll help for pre hospital stuff. Um, but the bone cauterizes as it cuts. So it doesn't, they don't bleed all over the place. And if you've got a certain bridge around your chest, you can't breathe because it gets so tight, your chest won't expand. So we do cuts anterior to the mid-axillary line, and then transverse like this to put a, like a square in the middle of them, and that square can move up and down so they can move. So that's why we do the escarotomies. Um, we have a portable vent, we have the regular vents, we have a bypass machine, and we also have a machine called the VDR, volumetric respirator. It looks like it's doing this all the time. It moves secretions up and has an air leak. It's used on people with really, really, really bad pulmonary stats. So it's also used in conjunction with ECMO, incorporeal membrane oxygenation. We also do that in the And we actually transport people from all over the place uh, with portable ECMO machines and fly them to a manual on ECMO and then keep them on ECMO at a manual until they're well enough to come off the machine. We save a lot of life. But the VDR, runs on air, and the portable version fits in a briefcase. Yeah? I'm not sure how much people know what that one is. Um, it's heart-lung bypass. That's the easiest way to put it. That's basically what it is. It takes over for your pulmonary until your pulmonary is healthy enough to work for itself. Um, we also have hyperbaric connected with the burn unit. But we only use it for wound care. But we don't have the mono chambers like a lot of people have, where it's just one person and a two. We have a uh, chamber that holds 12 people at a time. Plus, a physician or a nurse and a tech can be in there with them. So if anything happens, they've got medical right there in the unit with them so that they can immediately take care of it. So uh, there's a lot going on. 
And we also do continuous kidney dialysis. And some of our nurses are cross-trained to work in the outpatient clinic downstairs as well as in the hangar barrack. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do working in the regiment. Um, this room will also be as hot as we can get it because the third leading cause of death for burn victims is hypothermia. You lose your skin, you lose your ability to hold in heat. So all you need to remember for a burn patient, if you can do this, you've done burn care. Clean, warm, and dry. Not sterile. Burn is not a sterile procedure, it's a clean procedure. Clean, warm, and dry. You don't need a sterile blanket for it. Just a clean blanket is all you need. So, crank the heat up as high as you can get it. On transport, if you know you're picking up a burn patient, turn the heat up in your box as high as you can get it. If you're in a room with a burn patient, the temperature key was comfortable, it's too cold. New nurses complain about the heat in the burn unit. It's excruciatingly hot and you're wearing full isolation stuff, so you sweat a lot. You're likely to pass out sometimes. Um, <clears throat> you can use, never use ice on a burn for any size burn because I don't want you to get in the habit of using it. But cool but not ice cold water can be used for a maximum of five minutes to stop the burning process. You're still hot, you're still burning. After five minutes, stop. You're not doing any good. If it still hurts, that's a good sign. It means it's not that deep of a burn and it's going to heal on its own. Does not hurting equate healing? No, it just feels good. But it's not going to heal. If it gets too cold, it's the blood flow. It goes into the inner part of the body, right? If you don't have nutrients and oxygen going to the area first, can actually convert to a deeper burn. And I've seen people succumb to hypothermia in the burn unit. I've seen people leave their facility at 37 degrees Celsius. They had wet towels on their hands and showed up to us at 30 degrees Celsius. And that is too cold. Then we take a couple of days to warm them back up. Uh, you can use water on some stucco like tar or pavement. But don't peel it off to do more damage. Use mineral oil on tar and pavement. About two days, every four hours, you take the dressings, and that stuff lifts right off. If they have a chemical exposure, universal precautions for you, and then just remember the solution to the pollution is dilution. Flush, flush, flush with water, minimum of 15 to 30 minutes. Contact poison control and hazmat. They have the answers to all that stuff. Never use a neutralizer on a chemical. It actually heats it up and causes more damage. If it's a dry chemical, you brush it off. And there's an app you can get for your smartphone, and I'm sure there's some first responders have this, it's called Wiser. You guys heard about it? It's the NIH. If you have an Apple phone, <coughs> sorry, I'm an Android guy. <laughs> uh, you have to go to their website, NIH, to get the app, so they took it off the App Store for Apple. You can still get it on the Android, it's free. It's like having an SDS sheet in the palm of your hand for every chemical out there. And if you see somebody running down the street on the fire, it's okay to throw a bucket of water and the flames at you stop the heating process. Once that heating process is stopped, all their jewelry, including piercings, need to come off and out. If my right arm is burned up, this ring on my left hand is going to be a problem because your whole body swells up from the burn. And also include piercings because I live in Portland and we are now in the Eugene area, right? I've seen patients over 39 years of piercings where I read and go, yeah, you know, I don't know if I would pierce that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some interesting stuff. Things that made them scream and jump back and go, why and how did you do that? I don't know, I think I was drinking. Oh, you're doing something. <laughs> the only ones you can't take out are subdermis. You know, those ones under the skin? You can't take those out. And all their clothes need to come off because their clothes can continue to burn. How many people in here besides me have ever put on a pair of 501 jeans right out of the dryer? <laughs> Were the buttons still hot? Yes. <laughs> okay, now I'm an old guy, so I like to pass on sage wisdom to you. <laughs> things to avoid in later life. You never put on a pair of 501 jeans out of the dryer to go in. Okay? Just don't do that. You'll never ever forget that feeling. So that's the same advice for old guys. Commando, do not put on pair of <laughs> And then just cover them up with a clean, dry blanket, sheet, coat, sleeping bag, solar blanket, saran wrap, whatever you've got, you can put over the top of them, help hold them in the heat. You've done burn care. Don't do anything else unless we tell you to. Because we use a lot of different topicals on birds for different steps. This is our team. I apologize for our paramedic friends that I use these three items from MAD versus examples of PMS from Mountain State University. No, they're pretty nice guys. 
For all of you nursing students here, let me just tell you one thing. I have done trauma and burns for 39 years. I cannot do what they do. My hat is off to anybody that's a first responder. I've seen some horrible, horrible stuff over the years. They see the stuff I don't see. Plain and simple. When you get a patient, you've got some time to assess them. They've got a few minutes. You want to learn how to do patient assessment? Follow a paramedic around. You'll learn patient assessment. I think they, they have to go to the hospitals and do time in the hospitals when they're going through paramedic training. And how many times have you been stuck in a corner for 12 hours and forgot about it? Okay? That's why when I do my paramedic training, I do it at your school and I spend an entire day with you going through scenarios. Why don't we require nursing students to spend at least one day with EMS? I've never been able to figure that out. <coughs> if you get a chance to ride along with EMS, you should do it. You really should. Then you'll understand why they're telling you what they're telling you when they're handing off a patient to you. And you'll see what it is they have to do out there where people say, you're doing your job wrong, and running around and screaming and yelling and trying to help out. They're working in the trenches, so. Bravo to anybody that's perfect. <laughs> well, maybe not these guys. <laughs> <laughs> we have 50 or so nurses work between the inpatient and outpatient part of the clinic that we do is burns and wounds. That's all we do. Oh, we also take care of kids that burn. The youngest patient we've had in the last couple of years was five days old. Oh. Mama's home and baby and cut hot tea and she tricked and spilled the tea on the we have a pharmacist on the end, so we've got that resource there every day of the week. So we can say, you're drug agents, you're drug me in, or we give them the right antibiotics. We have three burn doctors in the state of Oregon. They're all at the Oregon Burn Center. They're general surgeons, and they've done a two-year fellowship in burns. Four years of college, four years of medical school, six years of residency, and two years of fellowship. That's 16 years. And for plastics, there's another one or two years on top of that. So they go through a lot of training. That's why it bothers me when nurses try to tell the doctors they don't know what they're doing. They've done a lot more training than we have. We have surgical residents and physician's assistants, students that come through because we're teaching hospital. We have a nurse practitioner, Tom knows, uh, Teresa. She used to be our own nurse, and now she's our nurse practitioner with our doctor Tom. We have our own physical therapists and occupational therapists. Our patients are there for maybe a month or two. But they see them for the rest of their lives because they've got to continue their exercises for range of motion. They have to relearn things we take for granted, like how to tie your shoes, button your shirt, pick up a glass when you have no feeling in your hand. How do you do that without tactile sensation? They train them how to do all that stuff again. They have to relearn things we take for granted. We don't have a chaplain on staff. We have a chaplain used to hang out there all the time. Chaplain does, and I do this because all those jokes I told you about I can't tell, I learned from chaplain Doug. <laughs> <laughs> he knows some of the dirtiest jokes I have ever heard in my life. And he told me one one day that was particularly nasty. It even offended me, but I laughed. <laughs> I said, you're a chaplain. How did you get away with it? He told me he was spiritually bipolar. <laughs> He said he was just covering all of his bases. That's what he was doing. We have a clinical psychologist, Dr. Ogden. She's on the unit. She's there for the patients and their families and for the staff. We need to be briefed every month or two whether we need to or not. And she's there when we're having to do end of life work. And palliative care is part of our team, too. This is just a small part of our team. And when we're having to deal with issues and there's nothing we can do, how do you want us to handle this? And we get together as a family to talk about end of life care. And when it's a kid, that's tough. But it does happen. How many people in here want to go to pediatrics? How many of you want to do it because you really do want to go to pediatrics, not because kids are people want to play with kids? Okay. If you're doing it to go and play with the kids, let me just kind of give you some reality here. And I hope this doesn't overstep down to time. Kids die. That's the hard part about it. And that's the hardest thing you'll ever deal with. And I've had to watch a little bit of that and learn it. That's when you learn, you deal with people like your psychologist and your chaplain and your social worker, and everybody else help you be brief and talk through that stuff. Okay? But there is reality to what we do as nurses and EMTs and paramedics. We can't save everybody. 
and you just haven't learned how to be able to cope and deal with it and how to work through it. But taking care of kids is great. I love taking care of kids. We have our own dietitian. She's there to make sure the tanks stay full because they're on high flow, high cal diets, and they need to have a lot of stuff going on. She's changing their diets daily if she has to. Make sure they have the right stuff to help heal their burns because they're working overtime. Bird patients are hypermetabolic. And they can stay that way for a couple of years. Their temperature resets at 38.5. So we don't start doing blood culture until they get to 39 Celsius. Their heart rate's still up. Their blood pressure's still up. Everything gets hypermetabolic. So you've got to kind of adjust that a little bit to the bird patient to figure out why they're doing that once because of the bird patient. And then you've got to figure out who's the standard for this particular patient because everybody's different. And we have to talk about therapy because we have kids on there. And we also part, work with everybody in the state. Lifeline, Maryland, Reach, Calor, Mercy Flights, all those guys get patients to as quickly as same. This is our prevention part. One and a half million people a year get burned across the United States. We have no idea we made that number up. Okay? That is an alternative fact. <laughs> it's just a huge number. It could be more than that. It could be less than that. We don't know. We just made it up. But we know that statistically about 650,000 people a year seek medical treatment somewhere for a burn, and about 75,000 people a year get hospitalized. 1,900 burn beds, 75,000 admissions. We're full all the time in our burn units. And in our region, most of the stuff happens in and around the home. If you take the I-5 corridor out of the mix, from Seattle down to San Francisco, we're rural. But places like where I grew up matters. And the majority of what my dad was a seed farmer. Anybody else here grow up on a farm? What do farm kids do for fun? We set stuff on fire and blow things up. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we do for fun. Stunt's why gotta come out. What's that? Stunt's gotta come out. Yeah, that's why I'm surprised all of us have all of our digits and we're not burning with crisp. We call it gas on trash. It's usually an adult male, a can of gasoline, something that's on fire, and alcohol. <laughs> that's the combination. It's a gene. Guys have that gene. Okay? It's just a genetic thing. They just like to make things bigger and lot. But that's the best we've heard to see in the bird unit. There's people throwing gasoline on stuff. Ladies, you've caught up with us. It's a nursing diagnosis I made up called Jackie Nimble Syndrome. <laughs> Everybody's had too much to drink and you're camping with your friends. And we have just as many ladies as guys that do this. They're standing there like they're standing on a boat and they've had too much to drink. And they go, hey, watch me jump over the campfire. <laughs> <laughs> Down the campfire you go, you lay down the fire for the ball, take the ball from your drunk friends in real life, and you get out of the fire. <laughs> so ladies are caught up with us on that one thing every year. <clears throat> Oh, here come the pictures, sorry. 18 months old, dad let her stand on a chair next to the stove and hand landed on her. Ugh. Now this is a deep partial thickness. You know, superficial, partial, and full thickness is a new terminology thing. Deep partial is a deep set of the Can you see this okay, or we can turn off set of lights? Of course, it's just all on and all on. You can see it okay? This needs silicone. That's now deep enough for silicone. These are fourth degree, she lost her fingertips. Oof. We also see this with wood stoves, gas fronted gas, glass fronted gas fireplaces. Little hands touching hot stuff. Oof. So keep kids away from that. Right now, next year, Burn Prevention Week is going to be on contact burn. So I'm doing a lot of posters for the Burn Committee right now where we're talking about kids touching hot stuff or stepping in coals buried in the sand on the beach. Contact in here. This little girl here, um, this is partial thickness. It blanches, it's blistering, it's swollen. That's full thickness here. She's also full thickness from her waist to her toes. So she was on kidney dialysis for about four weeks and the kidney shut down because she got what's called myoglobinuria or vaginal. Okay. Um, she and her sister run around on the deck at a family function ran into a fire table and it hit it really hard and somebody put a deep fat turkey fryer on top of it for a half gallon of hot oil came on. Now she survives this, but she needed skin grafting and she needed to have kidney dialysis because she got to a large molecule called hemochromatins in her bloodstream and caused the kidneys to fail. But we got her kicked back in again in about four weeks from the kidneys. But that's a lifetime for her. 
there's a little stirring and stuff, but you got through the day. This little guy here saw a cup on the edge of the table and reached up and pulled it over. It was a cup of hot chocolate. With kids, you always have to have in the back of your mind, does the story match the pattern? Reached up, grabbed it, got pulled. Yes, the pattern matches the story. It's lobster red because it's a full thickness skull, but if you push on it, it won't flash and it won't hurt because the hemoglobin release from the damage cells will make it really red like that. What if he swallowed hot chocolate? What do I need to worry about? Right. And kids' anatomy is different, right? The airway is more anterior. All that swelling in front of the throat, can that cause his airway to scoff? You bet. There's a lot of things you need to watch for on this kid. Now, We'll talk about child abuse here in a little bit, but I'll just give you a heads up. If they wait three or four days to bring the kid in, if the story doesn't match the pattern, if the stories change, if the kid is clean to the staff, if the kid tries to take ownership of what happened, say it was all their fault, if there's other injuries that are obvious, you report it, period. We are required to report it. If you do not report it, you can go to jail. They're really good at knowing it, because when they go out on a call, first responders, and they suspect child abuse, they take law enforcement along with them. Because we've had people that they got there, and they started cleaning up the scene to try and hide another thing. So they, and they just need to have law enforcement in case the person's not that nice of a person. So they go along with them on these calls. So don't hold a baby in something hot, like a side door. Pots and pans, and move these away to the stove, and turn the handle to the the stove. Stir food before you stir it out of the microwave. How many parents in there? How many have little babies at home? Never do a baby bottle in the microwave. Because if they have hot liquid in it, they swallow the hot liquid, they can lose an the airway. Cooking appliances on cords. Boil the cord up and put it behind the appliance on the counter. New appliances have short cords. And when you're doing code, for building new construction. In the back wall of the kitchen, from a quarter over, you have to go two feet, and then every four feet up of that for outlets. And the reason that code is in place is so you can put that appliance between either one of those and it will reach either outlet. But what's the true reason behind the short cords? If they fall off the counter, what are they going to do to get there before they hit the floor? Closure. They'll unplug themselves. And some are now being constructed with pole apart cords. That's why those cords are that way. And that's why they have that code for construction. <clears throat> this was done back in the 40s. Some researchers wondered how long it would take to get a severe burn hot water. And when I say severe, I can't tell you the exact depth, but I can tell you it's severe meaning you probably need to get it checked out. 156 degrees is 56 degrees below the boiler. It's as cool as the coffee you get at the Starbucks, and it takes one second of exposure. And they brought it all the way down to 124 degrees for three minutes. And you think, well, it seems, you know, besides researchers, who's going to hold 124 degree water on their arm for three minutes? We have patients with seizure disorders or an older person who has a stroke or TIA while they're in the shower. And on the way down, they just want to burn from the into hot water, turn it on full blast, and they lay in there in the bottom of the tub of hot water for an hour. A tankless hot water heater, it doesn't cool down. And you're out in the living room and you go, God, Grandma's been in the shower for like three hours. <laughs> you know, you were watching the worst Super Bowl in history and lost track of Grandma. It was. <laughs> Even the commercials were bad. That's four hours of my life I was. <laughs> Some guy said he made $7,000 to watch a Maroon 5 concert and a punting contest. <laughs> the other day I watched them diving in the hyperbaric chamber, that's what they call it, because they go down to two and a half atmospheres. And they take a little basketball in there with them, and it gets down to about 30 feet, it's half its size. And I'm like, hey, look, it's the Tom Brady effect. <laughs> anyway, she's in the bottom of the tub of hot water, and she needs to go to the hospital because she's got a burn deep in her skin graft. And so hot water heaters should be set at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. You run the hot water, you take the meat thermometer, it's over 120, you turn the hot water heater. Do not trust the settings off the dial, they're never accurate. Give it a day to recycle, check it again, and keep doing that until it gets to 120 degrees and then stop. New babies and older folks, check their bath water, and it shouldn't, for Shriners, be over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. For Shriners. 
Do these temperatures still take into account like your your babies that are a little more susceptible? Is there protective mechanisms in terms of their skin more susceptible as well? So is this 120 still? These temperatures are set for like normal mid-aged adults. If you're younger or older, they're different. Because your skin is thinner, you're going to burn up lower temperatures quicker and faster. So, and if a person's got bad cortical vascular disease or something else that goes on, limits their circulation or their skin depth, they're going to have problems too. So it's it's the perfect specimen. Then you got to account so play. Huh? So play is what you're talking about. Yeah. He's kind of got that 70s. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, it, it depends on the person and their medical history. There's factors that go into it. This is just this is just a perfect scenario. But 120 degrees is the is the standard for the industry. Everybody can handle 120 degree water for a certain amount of time. So. Oh, we'll go back. Run the cold and then the hot, and then turn off hot and then turn off the cold so there's cold water that's got they turn it on. And why would you never leave a little kid unattended in a tub full of water looking at it? And you think they reach up and turn on the cold? Nope, they always reach up and turn on the hot and bad and you can't turn them back on. My wife renamed the slide just for me because I'm home where she renamed the slide, hey, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> <laughs> or what could possibly go wrong? From putting something on something already lit. Gasoline or whatever. Adding fuel to a small engine, it may or may not catch on fire. How many of you are firefighters? Have you taken fire science? So they tell you it may or may not catch on fire, right? May. But what if you're filling up while the engine is still running? There's your ignition source. That's what we see in the burn unit. Use it as a cleaning agent. Hey, I can tell you the best thing to clean grease off tractor parts is gasoline. But don't be smoking a cigarette while you do it. Let me get those pieces. And using them around the heating element. Here's what you're working on. Here's a space heater. Here's a can of gas. How many people in here know that an empty can of gas is more dangerous than a full can of gas? Because of the fumes. But a lot of people don't get that. And drop lights and trouble lights. We think it was a meth lab. We couldn't prove it because the guy, there was nothing left. He survived. When he said he was cleaning grease stains on his garage floor with gasoline and a brush, when his drop light jumped off the bench, hit the floor, spark, and instantly cleaned his garage floor. Now he survived, but his garage was, so we couldn't prove it was a meth lab. Did I hear rightly the other day that they took away that law that you have to have a prescription to buy Sudafed? Mm -hmm. You still have to have a prescription to buy Sudafed? Mm -hmm. Somebody the other day said you don't need one, and I said, not Washington, but Oregon, you still need California. You don't need one either? But that's why in Oregon, we don't have as many meth labs in the industry. What do we have now? Butane honey oil. Shatter. Dabs. BHO, right? Guys are making it at home and they're blowing themselves up. Now take your notes now because I'm going to tell you how to make it. Because <laughs> we've been studying this for a long time because we've seen a lot of deaths and we've seen a lot of collateral damage deaths because of this. They take their pop, they put it in PVC pipe, they have coffee filter on the end of it, they take butane that doesn't have any order in it. They order it by the pallet overseas. You can get it from Amazon. And they shoot the butane down there, it extracts everything out of the leaves, through the coffee filter into the glass dish, they put it on a hot plate, and then they cook the butane off. So now they got this sticky, yellowish, honey looking stuff. It's 35 times more potent than the pot that it came out of. They put it in edibles. And they also know how a room full of odorless, colorless gas with a flash point, minus 78 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> and somebody goes, hey, let's fire up a BB, or their hot water here kicks on, and it's a full <laughs> walk to go. 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I've seen it blow up the garage floor across the street and the house off its foundation. We had a contractor that was killed because he was on the top floor of a house doing construction, and the guy in the basement was making butane honey oil to blow up and killed the contractor. It's a big problem. But we're still trying to figure out how to stop it because you can't limit butane. I find it all a natural solution. <laughs> And the other thing we have problem with are lithium ion batteries in phones and vape pens. There was a guy about a month ago who died because his vape pen blew up, the battery did, and the shrapnel took out his crotch and he bled to death. And we've had people come into the burn unit and have phones blow up in their pockets. 
and the person sitting next to him on the bus got hurt too. And my brother-in-law, he's a captain for Southwest Airlines, ex fighter pilot. He said they're trained in what to do if one of those things goes off in an overhead compartment and they have suppression in the bottom of the planes and somebody put one in a carry on and it goes off down in the baggage compartment of the plane. It's a problem, but we don't know how to. You know there's vaping competitions? <laughs> what you call a smoke ring looks like a train? <laughs> but they modify the batteries and they come back and blow up. Or they put the batteries in their pocket and come in contact with their keys. And then they go to what's called a thermal runaway and they blow up. So maybe the problem they've been studying for a long time. Okay. I'm going to show you two pictures of this. We see about 400 patients here in the burn center, a third of our kids, most of the kids are going to by 10 to 15 percent statistically across the United States. It's not an accident, it's an intentional injury. These people do go to prison. Good. They don't do well in prison. There was a guy a month ago, his cellmate killed him when he found out what he did. He was already in prison for life anyway, so he figured I might as well kill him. It's not going to add any more time to the area. Because of what he did, he needs to be. This is a hot water bowl. This is called a sock burn. We also see blood burns around wrists. These are not accidents. These are intentional injuries. The bottom of the foot is not burned as bad because it's against something. And you can see how deep the water was, right? See that line on the ankle? Why is it, if you were standing in a hot water bowl, would you be doing it? I'd be jumping. Well, I have a perfect line around my ankle. The only reason you can get that is if you're held in there. That's how deep the water was. That kid couldn't move. How many parents in here again? Okay, this was for potty training discipline. Does this kid look old enough to be potty trained? No. no. At this age, and at 98 years old, which Tom and I get close to all the time, yeah. <laughs> it is your job to poop in your diapers. Okay? It's in your job description. If you see me drink tequila anywhere in town, run. I'm older than 98. <laughs> you should be punished for it. We also see blood birds around wrists, and then they have spare space in their hands from doing this. We see too much of this. One is too many, as far as I'm concerned. The next one we do is probably because of the story they told us. They said she had the habit of setting on hot curl. Huh? Excuse me. I can only think of a couple of mistakes where somebody might do that on purpose, but I remember when they filmed a movie about a canoe trip to kind of catch my breath. <laughs> How many people know what I'm talking about? How many people don't know what I'm talking about? How many people in here have seen the movie Deliverance? Okay, for those of you that have it tonight, order it on Netflix and watch it just before you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and then tell Tom tomorrow if you have nightmares or you will not be able to sleep all night long. It's a disturbing movie. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. It's a good movie. People have said I'm not curly nerves. Is that a normal pressure point for setting? No. The depth and the percent, it's too even. The only truth to this story was curly nerves. In both these cases, these people went to jail. And Tom, how long have you been a nurse? Uh, about 30 years. OK, so we're about the same, about 30 years ago. Have you dealt with much child abuse? Some, but I haven't had too many children. When I was in ICU, I saw some. OK. There's a two-word phrase that I have heard way too many times when it comes to child abuse. You know what that two-word phrase is? Mom's boyfriend. <laughs> That's a classic phrase when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. Girls, let me just tell you this. If he's not wearing diapers, you can't change it. <laughs> wow, that's so true. No. It goes the other way, too. But just remember that. If you're not wearing diapers, you can't change it. So what's the serious burden? What's the depth and percentage? Priorities. Airway, 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 breathing circulation. Without an airway, nothing else matters. And priority is always given to trauma. A person's going to die of shock before they die of a burn. A person's going to die from a piece of heat bar through their head before they're going to die of a burn. Burn is always secondary to trauma. If you're doing the transport, do you, you guys deal with MRH at all? Or if that's just a portable thing? What's MRH? That's where they find who goes there. No. In Portland, we tell them, make sure if it's a burn and a trauma, you tell them a trauma burn so they come to a manual. 
So we can treat them both right there. I'll show you the fluid resuscitation protocols are now in place with the American Heart Association. I'll show you a chart that says when you should refer a patient to a burn unit. What determines the death? How hot is it? How long are you exposed to it? Doesn't that be high temperature, the long exposure? What's the thickness of your skin as a blood supply like? Like I said earlier, very young and very old have a deeper skin, I mean thinner skin, they grow deeper and thicker. How many of you have seen that patient in your, in your travel around hospital, little old person with a hand with paper, tissue paper skin you can see right through it, right? You can take a 20 gauge needle, leave it in its package, lay it next to their hand, and two gauge will automatically blow. We <laughs> 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 see those people. I gave care of them. Oh my God, a needle, blam! Okay, there you go, can't do that one. <laughs> skin used to be the largest organ in the body, but I heard on the news that now the mesentery is the largest organ in the body, something like that. So skin is now the Pluto of the Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of lost its place. <laughs> The top layer of the epidermis is the most resistant part of the skin. It's a superficial burn. It's a sunburn. It heals by itself in five to ten days in the It does not count for resuscitation fluids. You don't count that percentage because it's going to fade. We'll talk about that. The dermis is where we have partial thickness and deep partial thickness burns. They heal by themselves in two to eight weeks. They hurt. They blanch. They have blisters. They have beard. They have some broken skin. They're not going to. Well, the deeper ones might require skin grafting and have more problems, but generally not. And then down into the sub q is where we have full thickness injury. Those require skin gravity to grow the heal properly. They don't hurt, or they hurt very little, because the nerve endings are destroyed. No hurt, bad. Hurt, good. It's kind of the opposite of what people think of burns. Most people think the deeper burns hurt really, really bad. Eh, not really. And then anything below that in the muscle and bone is fourth degree. That's going to require amputation or comfort depending on the size of the burn. People that set themselves on fire, people that are trapped in the fire and can't get out, electrical injuries, and people who are so drunk or stoned they don't know they're laying in the fire, and they lay there and burn. That's a fourth degree burn. The top three functions of the skin are most important, especially the first 24 hours post burn. It keeps out bugs, holds in fluids, and regulates your body temperature. Clean water back in the air, and it will crack. It has three spotty weight. It produces vitamin D. Out of all 50 states, they did a study and found out of all 50 states, there's some place that produces less vitamin D than anywhere else. What do we need for vitamin D production? Sun. So where do you think that is? Yeah, we're right behind rural Alaska, up by the Arctic Circle. Vitamin D is linked to breast cancer, seasonal affective disorder, depression. You can't get calcium in your bone without it. You need vitamin D. If I remember right, isn't it the only vitamin your body produces? The other vitamins all have to come from the diet. Does K come? The vitamin K. Okay. Yeah, most vitamins you have to get from eating, but there's a couple that the body will produce. So when you get blood drawn, you should be checking your vitamin D levels. You can even take a supplement. Um, it's a sensory organ. You can pick stuff up without thinking about it. People have had hammers and deep have to relearn stuff. Things you can take for granted. And it determines your identity, the way your skin stretches over your bones. Like I said, I'm not trying to look like Santa Claus and beard to shake off. If Wilford really ever dies, I've got a job selling oatmeal and I've got to supplies on TV. <laughs> <laughs> My wife said, when you're home, you shake your whole face, you look like Dr. Bunsen Honeybee from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> don't make sure feet are a for a while. We have four classifications of birds thermal, electrical, chemical, and inhalation. The skull also goes under thermal. Now, this is a skull bird. This lady's only 45 years old. This is a survivable bird, but she's not going to survive. She got a ton of hot water and couldn't get out. The reason she's not going to survive, how many of you in here on your working in the hospitals or you in, out in the field have seen that person that they say, how old are they? And you say they're about 94. And you find out they're 40. Have you seen those people? Because like her, they've abused their body their whole life. She's been smoking, drinking, and doing drugs since she was about eight years old and never stopped. And every system in her body is getting ready to shut down. And burns are a huge insult, and you need a lot of reserves. And comorbidities, and being too cold, and poor nutrition, and a whole bunch of different things can factor into whether or not you're going to survive or not. We don't 
don't do prophylactic antibiotics for burn patients. We don't give them antibiotics just because they're burned. We overuse antibiotics. And we don't skin graft people right away because we don't know what does and doesn't need skin grafting yet. It takes a couple of weeks for a burn to do what's called declare itself to show what does and doesn't need surgical intervention. There's three zones to a burn. Zone of necrosis or coagulation right here in the middle where there's most damage. The zone of stasis out here where it moves out like this, and then it moves all the way out to the zone of hyperemia that never changes. So we watch these people for a couple of weeks to see what their burn's going to do. In her case, 11 days later, her burn converted to full thickness because of all of her stuff that was going on with her. She, and this is coagulant, but underneath there we would have had to skin back. We never made it that far. She died before we got to the old This was the last picture we took her of her because all of her comorbidities pushed her over the edge. Okay, that's burn conversion. We got that. We call these the grand masquerader because of this right here. You've been tissue damage. That's why this is an automatic referral to a burn center because we know what to look for. To nip it in the butt. Do not tell me they were electrocuted or had an electrocution, because if you do, I'm going to tell you to call a priest and give the family my condolences, because that means they're dead. It's electric injury or electric shock. You can have actual flame burns from arc flash or from such high voltage that you just catch on the butt. Loss of limb is not uncommon, especially if you don't know what to look for, and that muscle starts to swell up. And if it doesn't have any place to go, you interfere with the outflow and then you interfere with the inflow, muscles are going to die in the lack of circulation. 